Now that we understand how to apply Vesper theory to generate a molecular geometry, I want to talk about what is arguably the most important application of molecular geometry, certainly in general chemistry, and that's identifying the overall polarity of a molecule from its molecular geometry. So to understand this, we need to roll things back a little bit and think about the nature of covalent bonds. Covalent bonds may be polarized. In other words, the electron density in a covalent bond may be symmetric or asymmetric with respect to the two atoms that are involved. And we can use Vesper theory to predict whether within a molecule as a whole the electron density is permanently polarized or not. So let's consider a generalized covalent bond between two different atoms, A and B. If the electronegativities of the two atoms are very different, then we should expect polarization of the bond. So for example, if the electronegativity of A is 1.0 and the electronegativity of B is 2.0, well then there's likely to be more electron density around the more electronegative B than there is around the less ele electronegative A atom, right? This excess of electron density on B leads to a partial negative charge on B, which we can represent using this delta minus symbol. You'll see this a lot to represent partial negative charge, a negative charge between zero and one. The lack of density on A leads to a partial positive charge, again, positive charge with a magnitude between zero and one. If we imagine these charges on the atoms themselves, so the full partial positive charge on A and the full negative partial charge on B, and draw a vector from the center of atom A to the center of atom B, we get what's called a dipole or a dipole moment. You might also hear this referred to as a dipole vector. The strength of a dipole depends on both the distance between the atoms A and B and the magnitudes of these plus and minus charges. And we really want to get good at identifying dipole moments within covalent bonds and molecules because dipoles tip us off to the presence of partial charges and partial charges tip us off to reactivity. At a very basic level, chemical reactivity involves negative charges and positive charges getting together. So there's a key application to predicting reactivity involved in identifying dipole moments. Thus far, we've talked only about bond dipoles, the bond dipole between a pair of atoms A and B that are directly connected. But how can we think about the polarity of a molecule as a whole. Well, if we imagine a molecule with a particular geometry, let's take the tetrahedral geometry, for example. If this hypothetical molecule with the tetrahedral geometry has bond dipoles that do not exactly cancel each other out, well then the overall dipole moment for the entire molecule is the vector sum of all of these bond dipoles. And by the way, I should be prudent and mention here that the way we usually represent a dipole moment vector is with a little cross on the positive end and the arrow pointing to the negative end. And so what we can do is add up all of these individual bond dipole vectors to produce an overall molecular dipole vector, which I'm drawing in red in this case, that shows us the overall dipole for the entire molecule. And in fact, we can take all of the partial charges within a generalized molecule and represent them as a single partial positive charge sitting in one place, a single partial negative charge sitting in another place, and a vector connecting them. In other words, the overall molecular dipole. If the vector sum is zero or close to it, the molecule is called nonpolar. However, if the vector sum is significant, and this is most important when atoms of very different electronegativity are involved, the molecule is called polar. Now, vectors have direction, which depend on the geometry of the molecule, since these bond dipole vectors, notice, they're always parallel to the bond that they correspond to. So the directions of bond dipole vectors then depend on molecular geometry, and that's where Vesper theory comes in. So here are a couple of nice examples. On the left, we have CO2. CO2 has two equivalent carbon-oxygen bonds with bond dipoles that point outwards toward the more electronegative oxygen atoms. That should make intuitive sense. So CO2 does have non-zero bond dipoles within it and overall a somewhat asymmetric distribution of charge within it. 
However, the overall molecular polarity here is zero because the two bond dipoles directly cancel one another out. Notice that the linear geometry of the molecule is essential to that. If CO2 had a bent structure like water, then it would have an overall dipole moment. So shift your attention now to water on the right. Water has a bent structure, and as we'd expect, its two OH bond dipoles point upwards toward the more electronegative oxygen atom. When we add up these two vectors, while it is true that the horizontal or the X components cancel one another out, the vertical Y components actually reinforce one another so that the overall molecular dipole is an upward pointing vector, which you see in light blue on the slide. So it takes some thinking in three dimensions to identify overall molecule polarity. We need to do vector addition in three dimensions. But with practice, it becomes easier to notice where the components of bond dipoles cancel one another out and reinforce one another. And the situation for water is a very common scenario. I'll give you one other scenario related to the tetrahedral structure that we've drawn here, where bond dipoles cancel on some components but reinforce on others. So a tetrahedral molecule that is fairly common in organic chemistry is CHCl3, which has a tetrahedral structure that looks something like this. The CH bond di dipole is polarized somewhat towards carbon, which is a little more electronegative than hydrogen. And of course, the CCl dipoles are all strongly polarized toward the more electronegative chlorine atoms. So if we think about the X components of all of these bond dipoles, the three X components for the chlorines near the bottom of the molecule cancel one another out, if you think about the positions of those three groups in space. However, all four Y components are pointing downward, and so the overall molecular dipole moment vector is pointing downward strongly in the direction of the more electronegative chlorine atoms.